This is a continuation of our discussion about combinational logic. We're going to talk about encoders, decoders, and the multiplexer. These particular devices are very useful as they form building blocks for things like data path components, which will be a topic we explore in about a month. We've been talking about combinational circuits for quite some time. You could generally describe them as a cloud of circuits composed of various gates. We've had multiple inputs to this cloud of logic, and up till now we've primarily focused on a single output, which we've typically called F. But it doesn't have to be single output. We can have many inputs with many outputs, for example. F, G, and H. A classic example is the seven segment display. You might find such a thing on your microwave oven or certainly in the lab power supplies. The seven segment display is physically composed of seven LEDs that are turned on to display numerals. A typical display will include a driver chip. That driver chip has four inputs and seven outputs. The seven outputs, of course, are used to drive the individual display elements. The four inputs form a hex number that tells the driver chip which LED segments to light up. For example, to display a four, the hex input would be zero, zero, one zero, which would light up these segments displaying the number four. So this is an example of a multiple input, multiple output device. Another example is an encoder. For the encoder, let's assume it's connected to a compass rose such that we have individual outputs for north, south, east, west, so that's four outputs, and then northeast, southeast, southwest, and of course northwest. So this particular compass has eight outputs. To use this compass, we could design a circuit that accepts all eight of the output wires. While there's nothing wrong with that design, it would require eight wires. That's eight wires to terminate on the compass, eight wires to run throughout your vessel, and eight wires to terminate in your control systems. Again, nothing wrong with that, but it's eight wires. What if, instead, we used an encoder? So we install this encoder chip, but the encoder only has three output wires. We'll call them C, B, and A. This encoder will map eight input wires to three output wires. You could look at it this way. If it's north, it's going to encode the output as 0, 0, 0. Northeast, 0, 0, 1. East, 0, 1, 0. And you've done enough truth tables at this point to see where this is going. West is 1, 1, 0. And finally, northwest is 1, 1, 1. I would argue that this is quite an improvement. Instead of running and having to deal with eight wires, we now only have three wires. While we're here, let's label these. So we'll call this data wire zero, data one, data two. Keeping in mind that there are eight wires, but we've used data labels D0 through D7. On the receiving end, 
we'll use a decoder. It's another piece of combinational logic with multiple inputs and multiple outputs. This time it has three inputs and eight outputs. You could call it a three to eight decoder. If the input is zero, 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 the output will be D zero. If the input is zero, zero, one, data one, and again, you've done many truth tables at this point, which leads us to zero, correction, one, one, zero, which would be data six, and finally one, 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 which is data seven. So D zero through D seven. As far as the internal circuitry is concerned, the decoder is relatively simple while the encoder is something I think we better wait for another day. So looking at the decoder, there are three inputs. Let them be C, B, and A. Using the array style, we define a C not line, a B not line, and an A not line. That takes care of our three inputs. Now we need to take care of our eight outputs. The first output is composed of a three input AND gate. We'll call this data zero. It will be sensitive to C not, B not, A not. So when this is C not, B not, A not, output D0 will be on. The next output is data 1. That will be sensitive to C not, B not, A. C not, B not, A. From there, we just continue down the line until we arrive at the last output which is data 7, sensitive to C, B, A. C, B, and A. Looking back, we see the decoder, three inputs, eight outputs, and a sort of truth table that tells us that input 0, 0, 0 will light up output D0 and so on till we get to input 111, which will light up output D7. At this point, we could go back and explore the logic used to build the encoder, but I think I'll pass on that right now. Because with eight inputs, the truth table doesn't have eight entries. It has two to the eighth entries, which means that there are 256 unique inputs into this encoder. There are ways to get around that. In fact, I'll leave that as a homework assignment for you to look up what is meant by a priority encoder and to see how the don't cares help us get around the fact that there are 256 different combinations. Our next logic circuit is the multiplexer, otherwise known as the MUX. In block diagram form, the MUX looks like this. We'll let this be a 4 to 1 MUX. Its inputs are input 0, input 1, 2, and Three. This four input MUX also has two control lines. We'll call it select one and select zero. And finally we have the output. You could think of the MUX as a switch. These select lines will control which of the inputs gets routed to the output. So there are four unique inputs 
and to select from four unique inputs you'll need two control lines. A sort of truth table looks like this. Select one, select zero, and then the output. So if select one and select zero are both zero, we'll let input zero be routed to the output. So that's what this means right here. If these are both at zero, that is the output. So if this is a one, the output will be a one. If this is a zero, the output will be a zero. So again, whatever input zero is, will be what output is. Zero one, we'll let that be input one as the output. One zero, input two, and finally one one, will be input three. So again, the, the select lines are set to one one, whatever's on input three will be sent to the output. So if this is a one, this will be a one. If this is a zero, it'll be a zero. As far as internal circuitry is concerned, the MUX looks very much like a decoder. This time we have select line one, select line zero, select one not, and select zero not. Let there be four AND gates. This time there will be an OR gate. collecting all of the outputs. As for programming, let this AND gate be sensitive to 0, 0, which means it'll take inputs select 0 not and select 1 not. To complete the multiplex operation, we need one more input, and we'll call that input 0. So if select lines 0 and 1 are both set to 0. That means we'll have 0 here and a 0 there. So whatever is on input 0 will be sent to the output of this AND gate. And because this is a OR gate here, the output will be like so. Whatever input 0 does, the output will do. Again, that's assuming that SELECT1 is set to 0 and SELECT0 is set to 0. Let this AND gate be sensitive to 1, this one to 2, and this one to 3. And let the inputs follow. Input 1, input 2, and input 3. And one last example, let's assume select line 1 is set to 0, and select line 0 is set to 1. 0 and a 1 would mean this is true, and this is true. So now whatever input 1 does, we'll see that here, and we'll also see it on the output. Later on in this class, we're going to come back to the MUX. It will look a little bit different when we do, however. We'll start with something like this. And you'll recognize this as an 8 input MUX. Since there are 8 inputs, you will need 3 control lines, because 2 raised to the third power gives us eight unique things that we can control. When we get to this point in our studies, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Instead of drawing three individual wires, we're going to put a slash, and then we're going to say that this is a bus, a three-wire bus, which I think you'll agree is a lot easier than drawing out all three individual wires. It certainly makes the schematics much cleaner. The same goes for the input wires on the bus. So if we were to do this, and we were to say 
8 and 8. This would now be an 8 by 8 mux. It has 8 unique inputs where each input consists of 8 wires. If we were to put this all together, we would see that there are 64 input wires, 8 output wires, and 3 select lines. This is where things start to get interesting in the class. You could argue that this is a very large circuit. I mean, how many times do you get to wire 64 individual wires? Consider this. The central processing unit of your computer, the computer that you're using to watch this video, has a bus. Chances are it's not an 8-bit bus, but a 64-bit bus. So 64 individual wires might go into one of these MUXs. When you get to that level of hardware, you'll find that it's very easy to define this 4x1 MUX, and it's only slightly more complicated to describe this 8x8 MUX. You'll find that they differ from each other only by a few lines of code. All right, as we end our discussion, let's take a peek ahead to the Carnot map. Now, up to this point, we have been describing our logic using things like this compact sum of min terms, or the min term, or a product of min terms equation. So that'd be C naught, B naught, A naught. So that takes care of min term zero, or that's min term one. Here's min term four and min term five. Once the circuit is in this form, it's relatively easy to use the array style to come up with a gate level representation, or you could use the inversion bubble style or any style you choose. But it's a lot of work. One of the questions we need to answer is, can this be simplified? At this point, our toolkit is arguably limited. We do have some tools, though. We could use Boolean algebra. You might have noticed that there was a C naught B naught in these first two terms and a C B naught in these terms. We can rewrite the equation by factoring out each of these. So if we factor a C naught B naught out, we're left with A naught or a, so that takes care of that term and that term. And if we factor a C B naught out of this, that leaves us with A naught or A. So that's this term and this term. Simplifying a bit more, recognize that there's a B naught in each of these circuit, when all is said and done, simplifies to B naught. Now, which would you rather build? Would you rather build that circuit, which consists of a single inverter, or an array style, which consists of all of those min terms? And I think you'll agree that one is a whole lot better. The trick in all of this, of course, is to find the simplified circuit, which brings us to the Carnot map. You might describe the Carnot map as a visual alternative to the algebraic methods. To use the tool, you'll need to map min terms. From there, you can identify what are known as implicants, and that will give you the simplified circuit. Oh, and let's not forget that you'll arrive at a sum of products solution. To keep this video short, let's look at a few examples, and then next time we meet, we'll explore the Carnot map in greater depth.
the simplest map you could make consists of four cells. Let this be input B and this be input A. Input B can take on values of 0 or 1. Input A can take on values of 0 or 1. We could label the cells. So if input B is 0 and input A is 0, that is 0. A 0 on B and a 1 on A is a 1. And 1, 0 would be 2. And 1, 1 is 3. This is looking a lot like a truth table, isn't it? Let's suppose we're talking about an AND gate. If we were to transpose that into the Carnot map, it would be 0, 0, 0, 1. With our Carnot maps, we get pretty good at circling things. We would describe this as B, A. Therefore, our Boolean algebra is F is equal to B, A which of course is our AND gate. Here's another example on a two by two grid. Let this be input B and input A, where input B to take on values of zero and one, and A values of zero and one. We'll let our output be one and one. The corresponding truth table would look like this where 0 and 0 gives us a 0, 0, 1 gives us 1, 1, 0, a 1, and 1, 1 gives us a 0. If we circle the 1s, we would call this implicant B naught A, and this one would be B a naught. You read that as b is 1 and a naught. The Boolean expression for that is f is equal to b naught a or b a naught, which you might recognize as an exclusive or. That takes care of the 2 by 2 cells. Let's take a look at a 2 by 4. Let this be input C and this input B A. Input C can take on values of 0 or 1. Input B A can take on values 0, 0, 0, 1. Be careful. Be careful, be careful, be careful. You're going to want to write the number 1, 0 here. Don't. It doesn't belong there. Instead, it belongs here. And then you put 1, 1 here. There is a pattern to all of this. You'll notice that as we transition, we're only changing one bit at a time. So here, this bit gets changed. Next, this bit gets changed. And finally, this bit gets changed. Had you wrote 1, 0 here, two bits would have been changed. We would have changed this one and this one. And that is not what we're looking for. Let's go ahead and identify the min terms associated with each cell. The simplest one is when all inputs are zero. That means this will be min term zero. The other simple one is when all inputs are one. That will be min term seven. This cell we would interpret as C naught, B naught, A. So we know that's a 1. This cell we would interpret as a 3 because it's C naught, B, A. And this is a 2 with inputs C naught, B, A naught. Continuing on, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Let's see if this is indeed 6. So 6 would be C, B, A naught. So 4 plus 2 is 6. 
If you rewind this video a little bit, you'll find that we wrote an equation like this. And we simplified it and we said that f is simply equal to b naught. With the k map, we could have directly entered these min terms into the cells as 1, so min term 0, it takes care of that, min term 1, min term 4, and min term 5 where all others are zeros. As I said before, we get good at circling the ones. And now we have to ask ourselves, what combinations of inputs allows us to circle these for? It looks like the row does not matter because we have symmetry down the rows. Since C determines which row we're in, we can discount entirely, and this just becomes an x. We don't care what c does. Next, we look at columns. This term is interpreted as a naught, and this term is interpreted as a. Just like the c term, which determined our rows, it looks like the A and A0, which determine our columns, doesn't matter. Instead, the only thing we're interested in is this piece right here. If B is 0, we are in these first two columns. You'll notice that B is 1 here and here, and those two columns are not active. Therefore, we can say that the solution to this K map is simply B naught, which is exactly what we found earlier using Boolean algebra. That brief introduction to K maps we'll have to do for now. When you come back next time, we'll pick up where we left off with the three input K maps, then we'll look at four input K maps, and we'll see if we can make sense of five input K maps. So get ready to do things in three dimensions.